Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to this evening's program, Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Tonight, we're honored to have as our guest, Sheldon Krimsky. Sheldon Krimsky is a professor of urban and environmental policy and planning in the School of Arts and Sciences, Tufts University and a adjunct professor in public health and family medicine at the Tufts School of Medicine. He also teaches at the New School in New York City. Dr. Krimsky's list of accomplishments is so lengthy that I must limit this introduction to only a few highlights and refer you to the Science for the Public website to view his many distinctions. He brings to his field a background in both science and philosophy, and that combination may account for his unique perceptiveness. For decades, Dr. Krimsky has focused on the ways in which scientific advances often create unanticipated health concerns and ethical issues. For example, he alerted the public and policymakers early on about the health risks of endocrine disruptors such as BPA. He warned about the potential medical and ethical risks of biotechnology, especially in genetic splicing and GMOs. And he's been a leading voice in alerting the public about how the DNA databases can violate very basic rights. He's a founding member and board chair of the Council for Responsible Genetics. When considering Dr. Krimsky's work, it's good to recall how serious warnings have so often been ignored or ridiculed, both by vested interests and a complacent public. We're easily reminded of how vested interests undermine those who warned about tobacco, toxins such as DDT, PCBs and BPA, and nuclear power plants, ozone depletion, genetically modified foods, and climate change. In all his endeavors, Dr. Krimsky's work represents a major contribution to the improvement of public policy, and his work underscores why citizens today must make the effort to be well informed. Tonight, Dr. Krimsky focuses on DNA databases. We're inclined to think of the great benefits of DNA data, for example, in medicine, family planning, and identification. However, there's a darker side to DNA databases, and Dr. Krimsky's recent book, Genetic Justice, co-authored with Tanya Simoncelli, details how such data can be and is misused. An important feature of this book is the comparison between DNA policy across several advanced nations, which makes the reader aware of the possible shortcomings of American policy. The book is an excellent example of the importance of public understanding of scientific advances that may initially seem benevolent, but can raise serious ethical issues. As complex as the subject may seem, it's an essential one to know about today. It is presented in this book in a clear and interesting manner, and readers will be grateful for such a resource. It's a great honor to welcome Dr. Krimsky, not only as an outstanding example of academic research in the public interest, but as a hero to the advancement of science literacy in this country. The title of this uh, presentation is, What's Your DNA Profile Doing on a Federal Database? And I'd like to start off with a few uh, questions that you may not really have considered. First of all, did you know that in some states, police can obtain an involuntary sample of your DNA of an individual who has not been charged, convicted of a crime, 
and upload his or her forensic DNA profile on a state or a national database. In England, this happens to children as young as 10 years old. Did you know that police can follow you around, surreptitiously collect an object that you discarded, obtain a cell residue from the object, develop your forensic DNA profile, upload it onto a local database, all without a warrant or your permission? Did you know that when police collect voluntary DNA samples from a large number of people in a community, let's say to exclude them from being a, subs a suspect in a serious crime, that's called a DNA dragnet, the forensic DNA profile is kept permanently on a police databank without permission of the innocent volunteer, even if the person is completely not implicated in any crime. Did you know that if police find a close but not an exact match between crime scene DNA and a forensic profile on a DNA database, they can investigate the DNA of an entire family without a warrant or any individualized suspicion. Did you know that there have been over 250 individuals who have been expo exculpated of their felony convictions and released from prison on the basis of new DNA evidence? In one case, after a person was executed for a crime, it was determined that his DNA did not match the crime scene DNA evidence. That's the first case that we know of where a person was executed by the state who may not have been guilty of the crime. So the key questions for ethics and civil libertarians is to what extent and in what context do and should people have a right to claim privacy over their DNA? And how do DNA privacy considerations compare in medicine versus forensic? Some of you may not know, but there's a lot of protections for your DNA in medical science, but very few uh, protections when the DNA is obtained by the police. What role, if any, does the changing technology play on questions of privacy? And how do we balance the roles of personal privacy and societal considerations when we're dealing with medicine versus forensic DNA? These are some of the things I would like to discuss uh, today. But first, I want to help you understand what a forensic DNA profile is. And hopefully I can take you from the very rudiments of this uh, idea to how it is done by the police and their laboratories. Your forensic DNA profile consists of 13 pairs of numbers obtained by analyzing the DNA in your chromosomes. So each of us, theoretically, has a profile that consists of 13 pairs of numbers in the United States. It might be slightly different in other countries. So how do scientists and technicians obtain the forensic DNA profile, or how do they obtain these 13 pairs of numbers? It starts with taking a biological sample that could be blood, semen, hair, saliva, teeth, bone, any tissue in your body. As a matter of fact, if I take my thumb and press it on this table and then leave it, a forensic scientist can come by and swab it and probably get enough cells to be able to obtain a forensic DNA profile of myself. So that's the starting point, a biological sample. The sample is then taken to a forensic laboratory where technicians separate the DNA by chemical and physical processes. The DNA is extracted from the cells so that it is pure DNA. It's then put into a forensic DNA analyzer. It's a huge, big black box uh, which selects certain pre-assigned segments 
of our chromosome at 13 sites and measures the number of repeated chemical segments in those sites. So this is what the DNA analyzer looks like. It's not a very large piece of apparatus. And this is found in every school of criminal justice where forensic DNA science is taught. Now, each of us has 23 chromosomes. Uh, actually, we have 46 chromosomes. We get 23 from a father and 23 from our mother. And what you're seeing is 23 of those chromosomes on the screen. And the criminal justice system in the United States has decided that they would find 13 sites on these 23 chromosomes. And these would be the sites that they would look at to determine the profile, the forensic profile of an individual. So you'll notice, for example, in chromosome 2, there's a site called TPOX right here. That's a code name for forensic scientists who know that they can uh, excise the information in that site and determine what the numbers are for that particular site that make up your 13 pairs of numbers. All DNA is made up of four basic chemical units abbreviated as A, G, C, and T. Therefore, any DNA sequence in our cells is comprised of some combination of these four letters. And at a particular site, let's say going back to, um, going back to the one I just showed you, this particular site, they excise all the chemicals and they count the number of repeats at that particular site. So person one might have three repeats of AGCT at that site, whereas person two, somebody else, might have five repeats. So how does DNA differ among individuals? Well, the forensic DNA profile differs by the number of those chemical repeats. So I've given you three persons and on this uh, chart, and the, the particular repeated DNA is AGCT. And the numbers under it indicate how many times it's repeated. So you can see for person one, there are six repeats of AGCT. Person two has only five repeats, and person three has seven repeats. So we're talking about taking a piece of your chromosome at a particular site and figuring out how many repeats in that particular site of those four units, A, G, C, and T. What does your DNA profile look like? Well, because you receive one chromosome from your mother and another from your father, at any chromosome site you will have two numbers, one number uh, representing the repeats given to you by your father's chromosome, and another number representing the chemical repeats from your mother's chromosome. So I've placed one particular series of numbers, 13 pairs, which represents the repeats and therefore the forensic profile of an individual, 7, 5, 6, 3, 4, 7, et cetera, et cetera. Each of us, if we had our DNA analyzed, would have 13 pairs of numbers that would be different. That's our forensic DNA profile. What our DNA can reveal in general, once it's understood, we are now beginning to realize that our DNA can reveal certain things about our disease states, whether we have a, an inherited genetic disorder or whether we have certain predispositions toward diseases, mutations that correlate with the onset of a disease. Your DNA can reveal parental linkages, who your parents are or who are not your parents. Ancestral identity, that is, what region of the world your ancestors came from.
whether they came from Africa or Asia or um, Northern Europe. They can reveal sibling connections between brothers and sisters and familial disease patterns, such as if there is a particular mutation that appears in your family. The DNA can sometimes reveal environmental and drug sensitivities, and we're learning more about that. They can also uh, reveal your identity. So if you've been somewhere and somebody has your DNA, they can reveal whether you were at that particular site if they use your DNA as an identification uh, program. What does our forensic DNA profile reveal? The 13 pairs of numbers thus far only reveals our identity. The particular sites chosen are not known to reveal any physical or medical properties of the individual. But the biological sample that is obtained to get our profile is usually retained by the police department. So the police department has the most intimate information we can imagine, namely the information that's on our genome, which could reveal all of those things I mentioned before, disease states, predispositions, familial disease patterns, etc. Now, medical genetics have a lot of privacy rules. And there is almost near unanimity that an individual's medical genetic information is a private matter. Many states have passed legislation that protects people from the unauthorized use of medical genetic information. And the federal government, in a few years ago, passed the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. This means that an employer or someone who is providing health insurance cannot your, use your genetic information to discriminate against you, to prevent you from getting a job, or to charge you more health insurance than, uh, than anyone else. So the federal government has understood the need to protect us from genetic information. And these laws are tied to an anti-genetic discrimination goals. For example, the Federal Genetic Non-Discrimination Act, often called GINA, prohibits access to individual genetic information by insurance companies, prohibits insurance companies from requesting that applicants be genetically tested, and prohibits employers from testing, genetically testing uh, prospective employees. James Watson was one of the two scientists who discovered the structure of DNA in 1953. And he is, of course, uh, emblazoned in the history of science. At age 79, Watson donated his DNA to be sequenced at a cost of about a million dollars. However, he expressed an expectation of privacy regarding a segment of his genetic code. Uh, Part of that code reveals information about whether or not he has a predisposition to Alzheimer's disease. One of his grandmothers died of Alzheimer's at the age of 84. And he figures he has maybe one of, in a chance, one of four chances. And he doesn't want to know. And he doesn't want anybody else to know. And this is just an example of how people feel about certain privacy aspects of what's on their DNA or on their genome. This chart that I have on the, um, on the screen shows how much more information we have about diseases or which are known, genetic diseases which are now being tested. There's over 1,200 diseases that we can now test uh, on a person's uh, DNA. And the question is whether or not you or somebody else has an interest in that information. So you have people, of course, who strongly oppose others getting their hands on their DNA because the information has such importance and such intimate uh, value to you.
So to what extent does privacy enter into forensic uses of DNA? The courts have upheld the Fourth Amendment privacy rights in relationship to the degree of intrusion our bodies, our home, our auto, entering a phone booth with an expectation of privacy, thermal imaging of a home. These are considered uh, intrusions in our privacy when there is no warrant, uh, without a warrant. So would it uh, be an intrusion if somebody looks into our DNA without a warrant? That's a big question. And the courts have not totally resolved that question. Courts have resolved the question of whether or not a policeman without a warrant can demand your DNA. And the answer is no. That's intrusive. Uh, now they can get a warrant to do it, but that means that they have to go to a judge uh, for uh, the court to make that decision. To the extent, of course, the conditions for a reasonable expectation of privacy in other areas have to do with the extent to which the DNA is exposed to the public. If something is exposed to the public, generally the courts have said you don't have an expectation of privacy. If you open your window shades and people walk by and they see something in your home, then you really don't have an expectation of privacy. Uh, another condition is the extent of bodily intrusion in obtaining uh, something from you, like a DNA sample. It is intrusive to obtain a DNA sample, but not as intrusive as it used to be. It used to be pretty intrusive because they had to stick a needle in your arm and get a blood sample. Now they can just put a, fing a swab in your cheek and just get us, uh, some of your saliva, which is not as intrusive as a needle in your arm. But still, under the Fourth Amendment, we are protected uh, from someone doing that without a court warrant. When suspicion is low and intrusiveness is high, the Fourth Amendment protection is generally high. In contrast, as suspicion grows and intrusiveness diminishes, then the protection against the invasion of privacy by law enforcement weakens. So law enforcement agents can get a court order for forced blood samples, but they can't do it without a court order. And as DNA identification no longer requires a blood sample, a but rather a cheek swab, intrusiveness has dropped precipitously, and so too has Fourth Amendment protection. So I can show you this chart here, which basically illustrates that that as the intrusiveness gets higher and the suspicion lower, then the Fourth Amendment protection is much greater. But as the intrusiveness is low and the suspicion is high, then the Fourth Amendment protection is very low. So if a policeman sees somebody suspicious, looks like he might have committed a crime, then he has a right to ask that person to empty his pockets. Uh, or to take further, uh, 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 take further conditions in terms of gathering information from that individual. You can also see that individuals are given higher or lower protection depending upon what their relationship is with the courts. Somebody who is incarcerated has very low privacy protections. On the other hand, somebody way up at the top, a suspicionless individual, has very high Fourth Amendment protections. And of course, this changes if the state has special needs or if there's a certain balancing. For example, uh, somebody who is uh, an engineer on a train who is driving a train does not have protections against privacy when they uh, want to do a, a sample of his urine to find out if he's uh, taking drugs. And that has to do with the protection of society. So who gets their DNA on the federal database called CODIS? The term DNA creep is the expression for the widening of criteria for including DNA samples on national databanks. 
Convicted for, uh, person convicted for felonies will get their DNA for sure on the database. Person charged with felonies may or may not. Usually their DNA will be taken. Increasingly, however, DNA creep means that people who were arrested or detained for felonies, picked up for misdemeanors, entering the country, these people will get their DNA on data banks in certain states where they have passed laws that have opened up the process of putting people's DNA on the national data bank. And of course, somebody can just follow you around and find a cup of yours and have your DNA profiled and do anything they want with it. As a matter of fact, this article appeared in the New York Times called The DNA Age, Stalking Strangers. And apparently there's no law against somebody stalking you, finding your DNA, and profiling it, and doing what they wish with it. Here's a little cartoon talking about uh, somebody who gave up their DNA and found out that perhaps they uh, weren't the father of the uh, baby. In um, England, they have perhaps the most aggressive DNA data banking system in the world. They'll take the DNA of anyone over 10 years old and they will put it on a data bank. And even if somebody is innocent, they will not take the DNA off the data bank. They'll keep it on and they have the largest percentage of their population in the world on a DNA data bank. In England, one of the uh, chairperson of the Human Genetics Commission commented on that. Until now, there has been nothing to stop an unscrupulous person, perhaps a journalist or a private investigator, from secretly taking an everyday object used by a public figure like a coffee mug or a toothbrush with the express person purpose of having the person's DNA analyzed. The British were the first country in the world to prevent non-police from taking somebody's DNA and analyzing it. One can suspect that they might have uh, been uh, trying to protect the royal family from having their DNA profiled on one of the daily newspapers, um, or protecting a government official, perhaps, from having his or her DNA profiled, maybe with some uh, some sequence that might be embarrassing. Maybe there's a sequence that, that they might get Alzheimer's disease one day. So in this book, Genetic Justice, we have proposed a set of axioms that we feel are important to protect people against uh, the, the privacy uh, uh, interests of their, for the privacy interests of their DNA and against unscrupulous uses, uses of their DNA. We feel, axiom one, the DNA genomic information that we have is analogous to medical records in that it contains highly intimate and personal information about an individual's disease predisposition, genetic abnormalities, paternity, and immunological sensitivity. The privacy of medical records in hospitals, including genetic screening, is comparable to privacy of DNA analysis disclosing anything other than identity that has no phenotypic or genetic implications. In other words, using the DNA for our identity is one thing, but in the United States the police hold on to the biological sample that contains all the other information other than identity. And that's the problem with intruding into our privacy. Another axiom, axiom two, all materials, including DNA, at a crime scene are open to forensic investigation without warrants that will help police determine the identity of the victim and perpetrator. There is no expectation of privacy associated with what a person or persons have left at a crime scene. So we're not saying that police can't use the DNA at a crime scene to uh, try to uh, determine who was there and who might have committed criminal activity.
Axiom 4, and we're not, I'm not going through all 10, but Axiom 4 states that by destroying the biological source of DNA, the forensic DNA sample, the 13 pairs of numbers, is reduced to identity, and therefore it has minimal invasiveness. And that is the way it should be done. The police should actually destroy your biological sample once they obtain it, justifiably, and use it only for meth means of identity and not for uh, containing all the other intimate information uh, in your genome. Axiom 5, people have an expectation of privacy of the information contents of their DNA regardless of where it is, whether it's abandoned or shed on their persons or medical records. In other words, if you throw out a cup in a garbage can, it's generally understood that you have given up the privacy of that cup. But we're arguing in this book that you haven't given up the privacy of the genetic information on that cup, which may have some of your saliva or some of your cells. That information is yours and shouldn't be open for anyone to access and discuss and report, etc. cetera. Uh, police, we feel, do not have the right to analyze medical, paternity, or ancestry information on DNA without a warrant. If the DNA is at a crime scene, then they can surely analyze it for its identification purposes. Axiom 7, individuals detained or arrested for probable cause have a conditional, diminished expectation of privacy for those loci of their DNA that are used to establish their identity. But if the charges are dropped and they are proven innocent, they regain the full expectation of privacy. The DNA profile and its biological source should be destroyed. It shouldn't be retained. They have not committed any crime. Uh, so that's another one of the, the issues that we have dealt with in this book, Genetic Justice. There is a tension between the medical uses of our genetic information and the forensic uses. And the medical uses are uh, getting more and more uh, concerned about our personal privacy, and the forensic uses are getting less and less concerned. Instead of there being a convergence between these two uses of our genetic information. Now let me give you just a story that will tell you uh, how complex this can be. And um, there are a number of stories in the book that we tell, but the Gary Leiterman case was a story that was featured on CBS uh, and one of the documentaries on CBS News. Uh, Leiterman uh, was a person who was prescribed painkillers for a problem that he had uh, with kidney stones. But he did not stop using the painkillers and instead figured out a way to get more of them when he was not prescribed them. He was a nurse and he was able to access the painkillers even though he had no prescriptions. So uh, he eventually got in trouble with the police and he was charged with a violation of the drug laws. The judge, however, uh, said to Mr. Leiterman that if he went to uh, therapy and uh, he wouldn't be uh, convicted of a felony. So Leiterman uh, went to a treatment program, which he successfully completed, and he voluntarily gave his DNA uh, to the police, who put it on a database. Then the police at the same time were trying to solve cold cases, cases that have, may have occurred 20 years ago. Jane Mixer was a University of Michigan law student, a brilliant young student, who was murdered in 1969. It turned out, after 35 years, uh, when uh, they put Leiterman's DNA on the federal database, it matched DNA that was on Mixer's clothing. And Gary Leiterman, who was 60 
two years old at the time, never had any previous police record. Uh, the only time he was ever involved with the law was when he, when he took the, uh, the uh, medicines that he wasn't supposed to be taking. He was arrested and eventually tried for murder, uh, even though there was no physical evidence that he ever had any contact with uh, the young woman. So it turned out that in the discovery of Leiterman's uh, the trial, that his was not the only DNA that was found on the um, DNA evidence of the young woman in, who died in 1969. They also found another uh, man's DNA. This man, however, was four years old at the time of the crime. So the police did not pursue that individual. One of the explanations for the fact that Leiterman's DNA got on the crime scene was that it was analyzed in the same laboratory that the crime scene DNA was analyzed and that there was a good chance that the DNA of the crime scene was contaminated with Leiterman's DNA because they were analyzed in the same laboratory, possibly by the same technicians. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, Light, uh, Leiterman is still in prison and there are still many questions about contamination. Now, if Leiterman had not given his DNA to the police voluntarily, uh, his DNA would not have appeared in the um, criminal laboratory. It would not have been analyzed in the laboratory and it may not have been contaminating the crime scene. It's not the first time that DNA has contaminated uh, laboratories. They had to close down laboratories in Boston, in Houston, Texas, in Chicago because of contamination. So you might argue, what difference does it make if I put my DNA on a national data bank? Well, the Leiterman case suggests to us that it could make a big difference. Uh, you may be an innocent person, but your DNA may contaminate uh, a crime scene and all of a sudden you're going to have to spend your life trying to defend yourself. So that's pretty much the one of the stories that we tell in the book. There are many others about contamination and about protection of privacy with respect to forensic DNA. Thank you very much for listening to me. Something about the book. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this book came about when I was on sabbatical in New York, and I was uh, given a visiting scholar appointment at the American Civil Liberties Union. I met up with Tanya Simoncelli, who was a policy analyst for the American Civil Liberties Union, and she'd been working on privacy and working on DNA data banks. And um, I found some of the issues she was dealing with quite fascinating and challenging. Because on one hand, you have the most, one of the most powerful technologies that criminal justice and police departments have seen in about 100 years since fingerprint testing had been developed. Uh, and everybody was quite excited by it. On the other hand, anytime you have a new technology, there's always going to be assets and liabilities. So we were trying to look at the balance of both the assets of forensic DNA testing, which everybody sees on uh, television. You can't watch a crime scene show on television without DNA being part of that show. And it's usually something like, uh, we've got your DNA, we got you. And, you know, and somebody knows that they got their DNA and that's it. They don't have a defense anymore. In fact, it's, it, part of what we did in this book is to show the fallibility of DNA as well as its appropriate and powerful uses. It's not infallible. So we worked for about three years trying to understand and uh, uh, the different ways that forensic DNA is used. I spent uh, 
part of my year in a forensic laboratory uh, school uh, in New York, watching students do forensic DNA analysis, so I had a fairly good sense of how it was done. I also uh, went to some of the best laboratories in the country to see how the professionals uh, do it. So it was a, quite a challenge, and uh, we tried to come out with what we felt was uh, a proper balance between personal privacy and the appropriate uses of this powerful technology to, uh, to catch criminals who deserve to be caught. Yeah. That's a, that's a terrific question. Uh, can you find out more from somebody's DNA than just their identity or their predispositions to disease? As a matter of fact, there's been some companies that develop that thought that they can actually, from your DNA, get a picture of what you look like. Now, that does seem a little uh, strange, but yes, there were, uh, uh, there were companies that were developed that were trying to create profiles of an individual from their DNA. I would say that the strongest evidence of a phenotype from DNA is red hair. If you've got red hair, there's a particular segment of your DNA that predicts pretty well, about 85% of the time, that you're a redhead. Uh, it doesn't work well with other colors of hair. Uh, but uh, I don't know about age. I haven't seen anything about predicting age. Uh, but they certainly can predict certain diseases that you might have. If there's a certain uh, segment of the DNA that is, uh, predicts uh, Gaucher's disease, for example, they can certainly predict uh, at a pretty good uh, a predictor whether you have Gaucher's disease. But I haven't seen anything about age. Uh, but that's... Yeah, I actually, um, to rephrase, what I'm specifically thinking, is there some way that the sample side to be modified or something intrinsic that would allow someone to know roughly when a sample was taken so that cross-contamination with an older sample would be less likely? Oh, I don't know of any uh, way that they can tell you when the sample was taken. Unlike, for example, if they get samples of bacteria at a crime scene, they know what happens to the bacteria and how long it can last and when it, it died or something like that. And there is a, a time segment that they can tell you. Or if they see certain organisms uh, at a crime scene, they can, some tell you, they can sometimes predict fairly well the time of death. Uh, with, uh, but there's nothing like that that I know with DNA. Now, in terms of the age of the individual who left the DNA, well, we're beginning to learn something about telomeres. These are the things that drop off in your DNA uh, as you age. So it wouldn't surprise me that someday somebody might be able to correlate the number of telomeres that are left with the age of an individual. So I, I wouldn't ru rule it out. Yeah. Except for contamination, are there other things that make a DNA sample not so reliably you, your sample? Well, first of all, uh, and I didn't get into the details of this, uh, the only real way they can tell that it's your DNA is if they sequence the entire DNA of you and compared it to someone else. That's too expensive right now. So they use the 13 sites on your chromosome, and they have 26 letters. Now the real question is, what's the probability that somebody else out there would have those same 26 letters who wasn't your twin? If it was your twin, there's no problem. They probably would have exactly the same 26 letters. But what's the probability that someone else out there might have those 13 pairs of letters. And for this, the police and the forensic technicians 
have what they call a probability factor. And they go through a long statistical analysis and then they come to the courtroom and they say, the chances that some random person out there matches this is one out of 10 billion. They come up with a figure. Now some of the scientists have debated those figures. It's not uh, clear cut. There are debates about those figures. It's still not going to be a small number, but it may not be as large a number as one in 10 billion or even one in a billion. And the closer you are to the family or to the inbreeding of the individual, the greater the chances are that you're going to get a random hit that would match those DNA profiles. Uh, so it is uh, an estimate based upon probability factors and certain assumptions. And in order to do this, you need a sample of the population. Let's suppose one of those numbers is three and five. One of those pairs is three and five. You have a sample of the population. You have to ask how many people in this sample of the population would have a three and five repeat at that particular part of the chromosome. Let's suppose it's 10%. Okay, then you have to do the same thing for each one of those sites. And, you know, but then you have to ask, is that sample of the population a random sample of the population? No way. They don't have a random sample of the Earth's population. So they choose a population and use that as their uh, as the sample that they use to determine what the probabilities are for each of those sites. <clears throat> Anything more would go into more complex statistics. Contamination, however, is the most probable cause <clears throat> for um, mistakes. And also, oh, there's one other area, mixtures. A lot of times the DNA comes in mixtures. And you have to sort out, <clears throat> you have to sort out, well, let's see, uh, is this a 3-5 or a 7-9? Or is this a 3-9 or a 7-5? Do you see what I mean? You've got to get two numbers for each individual. And if they're mixed, you have to figure out whether the mixture, what are the numbers for that mixture? And there are mistakes made. Or there are presuppositions made about the mixtures. And unless the defense attorney knows this, they can't challenge the prosecutor uh, that the interpretation of the mixture is an interpretation. That's another area where fallibility comes in. Another area where fallibility comes in is sometimes the DNA samples <coughs> are, um, are not complete. They don't have all 13 pairs. Maybe they have 12 or 11 pairs. <clears throat> in that case, they have to project into the 13. They'll say, well, we couldn't get 13, we only have 11. Well, 11 pairs, you're going to get a lot more people in society with the same 11 pairs, much more than you would with the 13. So those are the areas where there's uh, interpretations going on, mis mistakes. And of course, if the uh, police know their suspect, they have in their mind, they want that suspect. <clears throat> so the best thing to do is to isolate the people who do the analysis from the people who do the police investigation. And in some countries, they don't allow the police and the police agency to do the forensic DNA testing. They have a completely separate division that does that because they know that uh, once there is interpretive possibilities that the police are likely to say, boy, that's the guy, we know that's the person. Yes, we even have a way of interpreting the mixture so that person is guilty. And that's not a good way to do science. So those are some of the areas. Yes? Uh, 
Oh, that, that's so true. As a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> prisoners know more about DNA than the general public. Uh, they have to know about it because, first of all, some of them are innocent. And we've had over 250 people in prison who are exonerated uh, because their DNA didn't match the DNA in the crime scene. But one of the things that prisoners talk about is how to implicate somebody else. You know, just throw something on the crime scene with somebody else's DNA and the police are going to be at it. So if you're in a Starbucks and you drop your cup in the uh, waste paper basket and you leave and there's a crime, the police and then, you know, the person behind the counter says, I think the person had coffee here before they left. And the police look where the light is. They look in the waste paper basket. They pick up the DNA. If your DNA is in the database, well, you're going to get a knock at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, you were in Starbucks at that time. We want to question you, even though you're perfectly innocent. So, yeah, you, you're going to get DNA at a crime scene, perhaps, that uh, nothing to do with the crime. And that could be planted there very easily because it just takes a minute amount of it. Because the techniques for copying DNA have gotten so sophisticated, PCR techniques, like I said, I put my thumbprint on there, they swab it, the few cells they can use a Xerox process to replicate the DNA so they got enough of it to be able to actually uh, test for the 13 uh, pairs of numbers. Because it's so sensitive, the likelihood of contamination grows, it gets greater and greater. And uh, the story, uh, the first part of the book is about a serial killer in Germany. They were looking for a serial killer for 15 years in Germany, and it was a woman. Every murder scene, her DNA appeared, and they spent millions of dollars trying to find the serial killer, and she eluded them. And it was embarrassing for the police, <clears throat> not as embarrassing as what they found out eventually. Finally, this serial killer female DNA appeared in a place that even the greatest uh, advocates of the theory uh, had to agree was very unusual and very unlikely. So they figured out something else. They went to the factory where they made the swabs and they found this little old lady <laughs> making the swabs and contaminating the swabs. It was her DNA that appeared on all of these sites. And of course, the German police were terribly embarrassed and cost an enormous cost of money to track this uh, serial killer. And it was not a serial killer. These were not one person who committed all these crimes. But you can see the contamination could come from many different sources. And one of the major sources is from police who are handling the evidence. There's been a lot of discussion about and evidence that police contaminate their own samples. So these are some of the problems with placing DNA at such a high level. Some countries will not allow a prosecutor to convict a person strictly on DNA without any other physical evidence. That's how strongly they are that you just can't depend upon DNA by itself. And yet Leiterman was convicted just on DNA. They had nothing else connecting him to this young woman 35 years before. Well, this is an interdisciplinary graduate program in public policy, which historically has been named urban and environmental policy and planning. But it contains a lot of people with, uh, who address different issues. I happen to address a lot of science policy issues.
so it, it incorporates, though, uh, city planning, it incorporates housing, it incorporates child and families. And uh, Well, I started studying physics, and uh, then I started asking questions that my professors were not interested in answering. And then I knew I had to go into something deeper, uh, the philosophy of science. So I then started to turn my studies away from physics per se to philosophy of physics and philosophy of science. And that eventually got me into science policy issues. And from there, I just began looking at challenging questions and following my intuitions. Well, each issue I, I choose sort of gets me out of my comfort zone. And probably the, the last issue, the one I recently got involved with, which was uh, criminal justice and forensic DNA, had a lot of challenges associated with it. I had to learn everything I needed to know about forensic science, and I had to study the law in a way I've never done before. So it was quite challenging to be able to combine many of these disciplines, sociology, forensic science, law, into one comprehensive book. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of uh, resistance uh, yet to the um, book on genetic justice. And if it were to come, it probably would come from the criminal justice sector, and they usually remain pretty quiet. But in f other books I've had uh, that dealt with ethics and medicine, I've had a lot of resistance and a lot of criticism for people whose interests, whose financial interests, were going to be uh, impacted by the book. And of course, whenever I write about chemicals and health, the chemical industry is always watching me. Well, every time I, I uh, get involved in a project, it becomes an obsession. You almost have to do this uh, when you're probing deeply into subject matter. But I try to balance my life with family and friends, and uh, I live both in Cambridge and in New York City, so it provides a, enough of a divergence, a diversity of uh, activities. Uh, but I'm very focused when I work on a subject, not unlike somebody who is making a film and blocks out everything else that they do while they're doing it. I think that people in academia like to see their ideas get out to the largest audience possible. At the same time, they usually publish in uh, publications that are viewed as you know, appropriate for their discipline. And it's a tough balance. So most of my books are from academic presses, and it's not a popular press. Uh, but these academic presses sometimes have mass media markets, and that's what I try to, uh, to write in for uh, people who can take the, uh, you know, take the effort to read carefully a book that might not be you know, a popular memoir or something like that. Uh, and I always try to explain the science as well as I can to people who haven't had the background.